So anything with books in, I will try and make some content around it. I think it's becoming a bit of a manga era of great courage and great wisdom, and if only he was able to show moments of great power, then he would literally have the entire Triforce. You know, I've always wondered if I was a pirate in a previous life. Oh hi besties, it's Joel, and today I'm going to be reading a selection of books that feature swashbuckling pirates, and this is basically all thanks to my newest obsession, HBO's Our Flag Means Death. I mean, I've always had like an interest in pirates, especially with growing up with watching Pirates of the Caribbean, Peter Pan, Treasure Planet, like they've always been some kind of inspiration for pirates, and plus I have a distinct memory of playing Pirates of the Caribbean Death Man's Chest on the PSP. I sank so many hours into that game, so that's all basically led to this moment where I'm now going to be reading a lot of pirate books because I want to live the pirate fantasy, you know, sink into it a little. But essentially, A Flag Means Death has reignited my passion for piracy, the fictional kind, not the real life kind, and so I'm very excited to be doing this video today. I will admit, however, I'm currently only halfway through the season, but I knew from the very first episode where Steed showed his massive library that I knew I was going to make this video because anything with books in, I will try and make some content content around it. I feel like Steed's library would be so expansive, filled with like 17th and 18th century texts. It would just be really interesting to see what kind of books he would be reading. As such, I've committed to dressing like a pirate for today's video. As a lot of you already know, I like dressing to match the theme, match the books, and so I definitely have a selection of pirate outfits planned. As you can hopefully tell from this outfit, I've decided to go for a Steed-inspired look, for a more gentler pirate feel for this introduction. I hope you're all doing very well and that you're looking after yourselves. If you yet to grab that drink of water, please do so. We must remain well and hydrated. And if you've yet to check out my Instagram nor my Twitter, I would highly recommend you go do that as well because I post some extra bookish content that you're not gonna see here. Okay, so maybe you've clicked on this video and you have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, essentially, Our Flag Meets Death is a pirate romantic comedy developed by David Jenkins. Set in the 1700s or the early 18th century, this show basically follows the misadventures of aristocrat turned pirate Steed Bonnet, who's played by Reese Darby, and his crew aboard the Revenge as they try to make a name for themselves and they cross paths with famed pirate captain Blackbeard, who's played by Taika Waititi. <sighs> Both of them are just so, so good. This show has gained attention and acclaim for its portrayal of queer characters, characters of colour, and also the body positivity that it pervades throughout the show as well. It doesn't rely on stereotypes and problematic aspects to tell its story, and instead portrays each of its characters as authentic, fleshed out people. I just love how this show perfectly balances being comedic, but then also punching you in the gut at points with some of the character moments. It's just so great to see a show like this. Basically sums up the fact that we need a season 2 renewal quite soon. I mean, it's kind of a crime at this point that HBO Max has not renewed our flag me and Steph, and so, soon enough, a lot of us are probably gonna have to go, you know, do a pirate raid at HBO Max so that we can get our renewal. But seriously, give us that renewal now please. And so for this video, I'm going to be going for a similar vibe that I did in my last video where I read all of the books that eyes are and Heartstopper, but this time I've chosen to read a wide array of books, covering a lot of things to do with piracy. We have non-fiction, graphic novels, classics, we even have again some more manga, and also we have fantasy as well, which is going to be very exciting to read. But the thread that connects all of these books is the storytelling about pirates and the ways in which they present piracy. As such, I want to discover more about pirates and the different ways that they're displayed within fiction. I don't think we know everything about pirates, but how much do we actually know? But also, why do we gravitate more towards pirates as characters within fiction? And where does this kind of romanticization of the pirate come from? Plus, I'm definitely sure throughout this video, I'll be making multiple references to Our Flag Means Death, so you can definitely stick around for some intertextual, oh my god, intertextuality. Oh, I've been waiting to use that word. You can look out for some intertextual references throughout. And so yeah, without further ado, let us get into the books. Hello besties. So for the very first book, I decided to delve straight into a non-fiction because I definitely wanted to gather a lot of research about pirates and piracy before I delved into the fiction books. I felt like my analysis of them would be much more deeper if I already had some prior knowledge. And so I read Under the Black Flag, The Romance and the Reality of Life Among Pirates by David Cordingly. And this book gave me so much information that it's probably going to spill over into other reviews. I basically have like a crash course in piracy planning 
planned for this kind of segment. Buckle in, sit down, grab your beverage of choice, and you know, let's get into it. I'm just glad that I remembered to wear my sword earring for this clip because I forgot to wear it for the intro, and the temptation just to re-record my intro just so I could have my earring in was there. However, it was quickly, swiftly dismissed because although I am kind of a bit of a perfectionist, I need to know when I can like let things go, and I basically let that go. But Under the Black Flag by David Cordenley is an account of the romance and the reality of life among pirates. It is a detailed account of various aspects of piracy, such as prominent figures that are mentioned, such as Henry Morgan, whose manor house called Tradiga House is literally down the road from me. It uncovers life under the pirate flag, but also how the life of piracy has been romanticized into what we see it as today. Cordenley tells us that piracy has always existed, especially with Greek and Roman pirates, centuries of piracy under the Vikings, and then also Danes ravaging the coasts of Europe. However, he points out that the golden age of piracy actually occurred between the 1650s and 1725. The general history of pirates by Captain John is often cited in this book as it's the first account of piracy written down in a book form, and without it we wouldn't know a lot of the prominent figures of piracy that we know today. There are numerous analyses on the characteristics of a typical pirate, with the majority of them actually being professional seafarers. They were formerly either merchants in the Royal Navy or privateers, and also pirates were often distinguished by their clothing. Whilst most landsmen wore long coats and waistcoats over knee breeches and stockings, seamen wore short blue jackets over a check shirt, either long canvas trousers or baggy petticoat breeches resembling collots. In addition, they frequently wore red waistcoats and tied a scarf or handkerchief loosely around the neck. So as you can see, I've got mine on for this clip. So whilst the fashion in our flag means death isn't exactly historically accurate as seen by the numerous Twitter threads that have been done about the show, it's enough not to to break immediate immersion within the story. And then often to distinguish themselves, captains would often dress as a distinguished English gentleman. This is actually something that we witness in Our Flag Means Death with Steed Bonnet, the gentleman pirate. And he's probably dressed too gentlemanly for a typical pirate captain, however, it's his whole persona, it's his whole thing, and so we can allow it for this point. They dressed as a gentleman to show that they were the leader of this pirate crew, and as such, they were expected to be bold and decisive in action, skilled in navigation and seamanship. Another comparison I can draw to our flag means death is actually the racial diversity of the crew, which, as I have mentioned, is just as important as the queerness of this series. The representation within the crew of the Revenge is actually historically accurate as well, as more often than not, crews were actually multinational, with a considerable number of men on pirate ships actually being black. However, it is unsure what their exact status was aboard these ships, but there have been a few accounts to suggest suggests that these were former slaves fighting back against their oppressors. Speaking of their ships, the iconic skull and crossbones flag that we associate with piracy today was actually adopted roughly between 1700 and 1720. And by 1730, this flag had been widely accepted among many Western pirate crews. These flags were used to strike fear into the minds of their victims. However, if they did want to conceal their identity for like a sneak attack or just some reconnaissance, then they would typically don another flag. Typically, it was an appropriate national flag for whatever region of the seas they were sailing in. However, as terrifying as they could be, Cordenly notes that people often found ways to romanticize the notion of the pirates. Pirates have always been elusive figures. They attacked, they looted, and they vanished. Reason tells us that pirates were no more than common criminals, but we still see them as figures of romance. Various examples, such as Lord Byron's Corsair, the pirate melodrama parody The Pirates of Penzance, Peter Pan, and also Treasure Island all helped conceal considerably influenced the illusion that some pirates were really just misunderstood people who never really meant to harm anyone. We can also see the influences of this romanticization of pirate life within modern media today. I mean, Our Flag Means Death is kind of like romanticizing the pirate ideal a little, but I want to more probably point towards Pirates of the Caribbean, as aside from the bisexual chaos it caused, it really drew a lot of people into the idea of this fictionalized chaos of piracy itself. It really gave birth to a new age of piracy, if you will. Well, as more often than not, this fictionalized version of piracy offered an escape from everyday monotonous life. As for what pirates did in their everyday life, in comparison to the monotonous lives of the everyday person, unfortunately, there are no such archives for pirates. We are dependent on the dispositions of captured pirates and their victims, on the surviving records of pirate trials, on the records of the colonial governors, on newspaper reports, and on a few valuable journals written by seamen who encountered pirates or were themselves buccaneers or privateers. We are only offered 
but a fragmented picture of pirates in general, and it's even more fragmented when we consider trying to find out more about their daily lives. But there's inclinations to suggest that pirate life was actually pretty much well organized. But as we know from typical associations with piracy, gambling, music, and alcohol were definitely parts of the pirate life. But it was also a lot more democratic than we typically think, as in a pirate ship, the captain was elected by the votes of the majority of the crew, and he could be deposed if the crew were not happy with his performance. The crew, and not the captain, decided the destination of each voyage and whether to attack a particular ship or to raid a coastal village. Pirate ships were actually a community of people coming together to serve a common goal. And as such, they had to come up with rules and regulations that everyone had to abide by to ensure no one was being cheated and everyone was respected. And as such, at the start of the voyage or on the election of a new captain, a set of written rules were drawn up which every member of the ship's company was expected to sign. These articles regulated the distribution of plunder, the scale of compensation for the injuries received in battle, and set out the basic rules for shipboard life and the punishments for those who broke the rules. On the flip side, this book also describes two of the titular characters of Our Flag Means Death, Edward Teach, or Blackbeard, and also Steed Bonnet. For Blackbeard, Cornley includes a description of him from Johnson's General History of Pirates. Captain Teach assumed the cognomen of Blackbeard from that large quantity of hair, which, like a frightful meteor, covered his whole face, and frightened America more than any comet that has appeared there for a long time. The beard was black, which he suffered to grow of an extravagant length, as to breadth it came up to his eyes. In time of action, he wore a sling over his shoulders, with three brace of pistols, hanging holsters like bandoliers, and struck lighted matches under his hat. His eyes, naturally looking fierce and wild, made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. Compared to the Blackbeard that we see in the show, played by Taika Waititi, I definitely think they got Blackbeard down to a T, although Blackbeard here is like very much like a Blackbeard, and then we basically have Taika Waititi being like a salt and pepper daddy. All in all, I appreciate the attention to detail. This book details some of Blackbeard's exploits, like how he took the sloop Margaret in 1717, and attacked the Protestant Caesar in the Bay of Honduras in 1718. However, on the 22nd in November 1780, Blackbeard actually died with five gunshots and 20 cuts in his body. On the other hand, Steed Bonnet represents a common archetypal character that is seen in a lot of pirate fiction and pirate films. The aristocrat turned pirate who was taken to piracy as a result of a recent misfortune in his past. Steed is described at his trial in Charleston, South Carolina as a gentleman that had the advantage of a liberal education and being generally esteemed a man of letters. And and also, Steed did indeed Steed did indeed. He did indeed join with Blackbeard and his crew as they do in the show. It was noted in the Boston newsletter of November 11th, 1717, that under the captaincy of Blackbeard, Steed has no command. He walks about in his morning gown and then to his books, of which he has a good library aboard. However, however, Steed being given the death sentence. Now, I am glad that our flag means death doesn't entirely pay attention to historical accuracy because maybe they can fake their deaths or maybe Maybe the show can just throw away historical accuracy altogether. In this case, I hope so. Under the Black Flag has given us a wealth, a vast wealth, a treasure trove of information about pirates and piracy. However, I did find that the writing was a bit clunky at points and a bit hard to follow. And also, I do think it could have been organized a little bit better and paced better. But overall, it's a comprehensive guide to aspects of piracy that will come in useful if I ever decide to write pirate fiction. Which I could do, I might do, I don't know. It's just a good book and I would recommend it if you're wanting to look more into the life of piracy. Hello besties, I finished Tell No Tales Pirates of the Seven Seas and I had so much fun with this book. I loved exploring the pirate crew of La Sarene and just seeing all of the adventures and misadventures that they got to. So we can very much get into this and explore, but before we do that, a very quick shout out to the nakedness of this book. A very cool illustration of all of the pirate crew together. Tell No Tales, Pirates of the Southern Seas by Sam Maggs and Kendra Wells follows 16-year-old Anne Bonnie and her crew aboard the ship La Sarene. This misfit crew is led by Bonnie who has a flair for the dramatic and often she partakes in high seas schemes but when she and her crew are attacked by an evil captain who's sworn to eliminate piracy forever, Bonnie must look towards her dreams to find the answer otherwise she and her crew may perish. Whilst reading this book you may notice that Maggs and Wells have actually adapted the 
real life figures of Anne Bonny, Reed, Sarah Walker, and also Calico Jack into some of the characters within this book. I would actually class this graphic novel as an alternate history as Mags notes in the afterward that, I wanted to know what I'd be like if Bonnie had broken off from Rackham and gotten her own ship, if she and Reed had finally been a couple, if they'd picked up other awesome folks whilst out plundering on the water. In real life, Anne Bonny grew up an illegitimate child, daughter of the servant woman Mary Brennan and lawyer William Cormack. As a child, Anne was often dressed up as a boy and called Andy by her father. However, when Cormack's wife found out about Anne's existence, she stopped sending inheritance to Cormack. As a result, he moved to Carolina with Anne and Mary in tow to establish a new life there. And whilst he initially tried to set up a new life as a lawyer, Cormack quickly turned to owning a plantation and learning the ways of being a merchant in order to get a more substantial income. Yeah! However, said plantation might have been burned down by Anne Bonny after Cormac basically disowned her, but there was actual no formal evidence to suggest this. However, I totally feel like she would have. She later joined Calico Jack after hearing about his wild adventures of being a pirate and became his lover. And aboard Jack's ship, Bonny returned to pretending to be a boy once again, where the only people who would know aboard that ship would be Calico Jack himself, and later Reed, who would join the pirate crew ship. Bonny took an instant liking to Reed, and together they formed an instant intimacy, and the extent of this intimacy is unknown. However, I definitely do feel like Bonnie, Reed, and also Calico Jack definitely had the kind of polyamorous thing going on. However, Bonnie and Reed were later arrested and tried for their crimes as pirates in 1720, and they were tried like any other man and received the death sentence. However, both of them protested to the sentencing as they were pregnant, and upon verification of their pregnancy, they were reproved of their sentence. However, Reed had controlled contracted an illness soon after the trial and died, with their burial on April 28th, 1721. And as to Anne Bonny, it's actually unknown as to what their fate was after the trial, but I'd like to think they reinvented their life somewhere else. The stories of Bonnie and Reed leaves many questions to be answered. For Bonny, it calls into question the status of women pirates, and whether it was essential for a woman to dress as a man in order to serve aboard a pirate ship. We do have examples of women pirates such as El Wilder, Grace O'Malley, and another pirate that I'll be retaining to later on in this video. But for Reed, especially in the way that Mags and Wells presents Reed in this graphic novel, it really calls into question the way that gender non-conforming people were treated or perceived in pirate society. Reed would actually have a lot in common with the Jim from Our Flag Means Death, as both of them have a kind of similar journey of concealing their identity, and when it's revealed, they basically have this moment of, this is who I am, and you will treat me as I am. And, you know, it's one of those moments that I think in both respects it was handled super well and I think especially in Jim's regard where they're just like hey I'm still Jim and everyone just immediately still use the he they pronouns it was amazing and it really puts into perspective that I think pirate crews were just a lot more accepting of things that didn't fit within the normal standard this graphic novel was just such a nice quick read and it's definitely one that's more simplistic in part because it has this kind of like friendship is magic and personal growth is power kind of vibe but I think it's one that people have all ages can relate to. I loved the diverse cast of characters within this as well, especially seeing their own personal journeys in certain respects. Moments that I really loved were like the interactions between Mimba and Katie being like, hey, is this seat taken? And then the relationship between Sarah and her mother. That was just something that I really enjoyed reading as well. However, though, I did find some of the elements within this graphic novel were quite rushed, and I really wasn't a massive fan of the way that this ended on a cliffhanger, especially because we don't know whether there's going to be a sequel to this graphic novel or not. Overall though, this book gives us an alternative glance into what life could have been like for pirate women and gender non-conforming pirates as well. It almost feels like this book is basically like a gender flipped, our flag means death, and then Jim became Reed, you know? But nonetheless, this is definitely a graphic novel that I vastly enjoyed and would recommend to anyone of all ages and would probably reread in the future as well. Honestly, like this pirate hat combined with this shit, I think it matches. I think it does very well. So I knew I couldn't make this video without actually reading this book because I know a lot of you had recommended me this book time and time again when I asked for pirate book recommendations. And so when I finished The Mermaid, The Witch, and The Sea by Maggie Takuda Hall, it filled me with so much joy that I almost forgot some of the issues that I had with it. Almost. 
almost. The Mermaid, the Witch, and the Sea follows Florian, born Flora, aboard a pirate ship called the Dove, a ship that guises as an escort ship in order to steal from the rich by enslaving them. This time, however, Lady Evelyn Hasegawa, a high-born imperial daughter, is on board and accompanied by her own casket, going towards the floating islands for an arranged marriage that she doesn't want. And so when the cast and crew reveal themselves, Evelyn and Florian must decide whether they're going to continue to live their lives by the rules and whims of others, or whether they're going to put love and fate into their own hands, no matter the cost. I'd love to immediately go towards discussing Evelyn and Florian, the two titular characters and the two main perspectives of this book. Both of them go through their own respective character journeys throughout this book, and it's just so amazing to see. For Evelyn, it's definitely a case of aristocrat tin pirate that we've seen with Eid Bonnet in Our Flag Means Death, as she is a character who was once rich and now adopting elements of piracy in order to survive. It was definitely interesting to see Evelyn react to the differences between herself and Florian and become like empowered to teach them how to read, as she notes that there's freedom in stories, you know. We read them and we become something else. We imagine different lives and while we turn the pages, we get to live them to escape the lot we're given. Evelyn also being queer in this novel is something that I was immensely happy about. This is something that actually relates a lot to real life piracy as well, as despite the aristocratic people calling her crooked, the pirates within this novel and wider society couldn't give a damn. Even in Under the Black Flag, Cornelly notes that, since it is hard to believe that pirates were never prudish about such matters, we must assume either that homosexuality was never an issue among them, or that it was so widely practiced and tolerated that it was not necessary to include it in any code of conduct. And so from this, we can surmise that homosexuality was pretty much accepted on most pirate ships, especially since a lot of the pirate crews were mostly men. We can see this openness towards sexuality in Aflac means death as well, as a lot of the crew members do sleep with one another or engage in romantic relationships. It's this open queerness that just makes the show even more of a comfort to watch, as it doesn't even feel like any of these characters are going to be attacked for who they want to love. Throughout the novel, Florian tackles the moral dilemma of inevitably having to portray Evelyn as a member of the Dove pirate ship, but also the journey associated with their gender as well, something that Reed from Tell No Tales and Jim from Our Flag Means Death can relate to. In this case though, Florian comes to the realization that they're actually gender fluid, noting that there are those who are neither a man nor a woman, those who are born and called the wrong gender and must reshape this story for those around them, but you, you're something else, you're whatever is safe, both, maybe, but not neither, or interchangeable. Names are funny things, because they can feel like lies, but tell our truths. However, whilst I did find the romance between Evelyn and Florian to be quite sweet and quite beautiful, I did feel like it did happen a little bit too fast for people who are basically from vastly different worlds. Additionally, whilst I appreciate the inclusion of magic in any story, I feel like in this case, it wasn't entirely necessary, as for the amount of time that we spend developing the magical abilities, it's only really used once or twice within the novel. On the other hand though, the little stories that were sprinkled in amongst this novel were definitely ones that I loved reading. It felt like little childhood tales that you would tell at night. So how does this relate to Our Flag Means Death? Well, I feel like this basically proves the fact that some relationships are worth sacrificing for, but also the ways in which trauma can affect people in many different ways. And as such, I feel like this would be one of the books that Steed would have on his bookshelf if this book was published during the golden age of piracy, as I feel like he would love this tale for so many different reasons, and he would probably give this to Edward slash Blackbeard to read as well. But overall, this book just delivered an intriguing tale that I couldn't help but be drawn into. Okay, so I did in fact try to get like a one piece t-shirt, however I couldn't find any, so I do have like an alternate outfit. I tried to go for like Luffy's like waistcoat, but I don't have a red waistcoat, so we've got this red long sleeve denim jacket instead. I actually knew that I was going to be reading this before I'd realized that I was going to be reading Naruto for my previous video, but now I'm even more excited to have read this because I think it's becoming a bit of a manga era for this channel. And so I read One Piece by Achira Oda and and I enjoyed it very much. Like with Naruto, I didn't really know much about One Piece aside from the fact that it followed pirates. I've never even like seen anything from the anime, but now I know that One Piece follows Monkey D. Luffy, who's become inspired to become king of the pirates after listening to the numerous tales of red-haired Shanks. However, after accidentally eating the gum gum devil fruit, Luffy gains the ability to stretch like rubber at the consequence of never being able to swim again. However, Luffy won't let this stop him as he sets out to a massive crew and find the legend 
legendary One Piece, said to be the greatest treasure in the whole world. In this case, I read the first five volumes of One Piece. You'll notice that volume two is missing because I couldn't get that physically. However, I read it through the Shonen Jump app, so I didn't miss out on anything whatsoever. And the first five volumes basically cover the first three major arcs in the East Blue Saga. The Romance Dawn, Orange Town, and Syrup Village arcs. Where Luffy sets off and is able to recruit some members into his pirate crew whilst also solving the conflicts in these respective areas. I just immensely loved One Piece. There's just something about this series that makes piracy so fun and exciting, but also emphasizes the fact that there are those out there that are definitely bloodthirsty and cutthroat. We see that whilst the general opinion of pirates is a negative one, there are those that will celebrate pirates for doing good deeds for the town. And with the plot of each of these arcs so far, it's definitely a great introduction to the manga as a whole, and just to see like the key themes and key characters come out to play. It introduces enough wonder and adventure to keep you invested, whilst also introducing captivating characters that you want to read more of. Whilst naive as a child, we see Luffy grow up to be someone inspired by Shanks in order to become King of the Pirates, keeping Shanks' straw hat safe. Luffy protects this as it's his own personal treasure, and personal treasures are a motif that are quite frequently referenced to within like the first five volumes of this series. Because not only do we explore people's personal treasures, but also the emotional ties that bind them to it. We see Luffy as both a pirate who will amass the best pirate crew possible and go off to find the One Piece, but also we see him as a pirate who seeks to protect people's personal treasures as he knows the impact and the importance that they hold. We also meet characters like Kobe, Zolo, Nami, and Yusup, and each of them added so much to the story. Kobe being Luffy's initial companion was actually very intriguing to see, as I believe he will eventually become Luffy's kind of rival. Given the trajectories that both of them are heading towards, it would definitely make the story a whole lot more interesting if we got to see them in a kind of conflict. Zolo and Nami also made for some particularly interesting storytelling as well, with their own personal goals of becoming the best swordsman, and also amassing a hundred million berries in order to buy an entire village respectively. They really set up some really great character arcs that we can explore later down the line of this manga. Yusuf's whole arc during Orange Town was something that was vastly enjoyable to read, and especially given the way that it adapted the Boy Who Cried Wolf story and gave it a pirate twist, it just added so much more depth and I loved it. I almost did cry during this manga because of Chow Chow, the little dog during Orange Town, and the way that he just wanted to protect that pet shop with every fiber of his being because it was his own personal treasure. I did not know, I did not realize it was coming, but then I was like, oh, I'm getting very emotional here. Also, another point that I'd like to mention about the Orange Town arc, when we got introduced to Kabaji, I could not help but immediately link him to Girahim from Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, so much so that now every time I see Kabaji, I call him Girahim. I just think it's the way the characters look in and of themselves, but there were just so many good parts about One Piece, including the world building surrounding the society of the piracy, but also the magic of the devil fruits as well. I'm intrigued to see how all of this will be later expanded upon in subsequent volumes of the manga, but overall it's just such a good story so far and I'm highly anticipating wherever it's going to head to next. I would say I would try and watch the anime as well, however, I have also realized there are over a thousand episodes of One Piece, and yes, whilst you might say there could be filler episodes, etc., I just don't think it is worth the commitment right now. But closing notes, I found that One Piece definitely did have some similar elements to Our Flag Means Death, purely with themes of protecting what's precious to us, the personal character journeys and developments, and the age-old rivalry of the Navy versus pirates. Overall though, One Piece is definitely a story I was delighted to have read, and I'm very excited to continue on with it further. Hello besties, so for the next book I decided to read a classic, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This proved to be a tour de force of a classic and truly helped establish a lot of the ideas of piracy that we know of today, such as the classic treasure map, pirates wearing parrots, and also the infamous black spot. We see these ideas utilized in other forms of fiction as well, and so we couldn't actually make a pirate themed video without paying homage to the classic that started it all. I had this realization when I realized that the author of Treasure Island was Robert Louis Stevenson, that this is the guy that wrote The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and that blows my mind because the range that this man has? Amazing. And so, this book is set in the mid-18th century, and it follows Jim Hawkins, an innkeeper's son who basically uncovers a treasure map left behind by Billy Bones that points towards the infamous Captain Flinch treasure. Jim then shows this map to his local physician, Dr. Livesey, and the squire, John Trelawney, and together they decide to make an expedition to this treasure island, with Jim serving as cabin boy. And so, they get 
gather the crew together and Jim is acquainted with such figures like Long John Silver and off they go towards the treasure island where they're going to find Flint's treasure and all get an equal share. However, the promise of great wealth can also bring the promise of great corruption and a few of these men may want all of the treasure to themselves and they're not going to stop at anything in order to secure their own goals. So Stevenson was 30 years old when he began writing Treasure Island with the first 15 of the chapters being written in Braemar among the Scottish mountains in August and September of 1881. He quickly ran out of inspiration after though and because of his chronic bronchial condition which basically gave him large coughing fits and hemorrhages he couldn't go back to Scotland and so instead they went to Switzerland where I kid you not he was like arrived at my destination down I sat one morning to the unfinished tale and behold it flowed from me like small talk and in the second tide of delighted industry and again at a rate of a chapter a day I finished Treasure Island. A chapter a day. A chapter a day? <sighs> I literally could never do that. How, oh, how, mm. He was like a writing fiend. Stevenson grew up surrounded by sea life as both his father and grandfather were both distinguished lighthouse engineers. They frequently voyaged on Scottish coasts and islands on tours of inspection and Stevenson actually spent three years training as an engineer. It's because of this and his imagination that he was able to come up with so many of the things that we associate with piracy today. This novel has often been commented as being a Bildens Roman and it's present through the character of Jim as throughout the story he comes of age through the trials and tribulations that he experiences through being a buccaneer. Throughout Treasure Island, Jim is able to display moments of great courage and great wisdom, and if only he was able to show moments of great power, then he would literally have the entire Triforce. I'm just kidding, but I guess that Jim's great power comes from the fact that he's one of the only people that isn't tempted by the great fortune to do some morally questionable things. But it was also interesting to see the aspects of fortune unfold, because fortune in and of itself is kind of a duality aspect. Aspect. We can associate fortune with mass wealth and gain, which is probably the physical aspect of it in this novel, but then you also get the metaphorical fortune, the kind of metaphysical fortune almost, with good and bad luck, as throughout the novel people experience both good things and bad things. When speaking upon fortune, Long John Silver says, Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They live rough, and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks, and when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now the most goes for a rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts, but that's not the course I lay. You know, it's just so funny and interesting to see Silver say this, as not only does it play into aspects of fortune, but it also plays into the themes of deception that we see throughout the novel as well. It's this permeation of deception that we typically associate with pirates and piracy. And Izzy Hands also makes a feature in this book, the Izzy Hands from Blackbeard's crew. He does make a key observation, however, about how he believes the entire voyage was cursed with bad fortune, and you know, I believe he was right. There is no doubt that this novel had a profound effect on the presentations and performance of pirates in later representations, and you can definitely see this influence in Our Flag Means Death as well. And so I think without this novel, we wouldn't have had the amazing Our Flag Means Death that we have today, so we need to thank Treasure Island for that. Overall though, this story was good, and I definitely did enjoy it. I do find the writing to be a bit mm, at points, but it was just a good story overall. I even decided to watch the 1950s Disney adaptation of Treasure Island as well on Disney Plus, and you know, it wasn't even that bad, although I don't think I'll be forgetting Long John Silver's like facial expressions anytime soon. They're probably gonna stick with me for some time. So after reading Treasure Island, I decided I wanted to read like a remix or a retelling of this story. And so it is with that purpose that I arrived at A Clash of Steel by C.B. Lee. Now, I quickly want to highlight the nakedness because there are like two twin swords like debossed into the nakedness and that is pretty lovely if I do say so myself. And the cover art by Fei Fei Ruin is simply stunning and gorgeous. And I cannot begin to tell you how much I enjoyed this book. The prose was crafted superbly with the Lee's style being very poetic and also conveying emotion with each and every page. The way she can describe food made me hungry. The way that she described nature and the seas very much filled me with wanderlust. But all in all, the story was simply delectable. So in A Clash of Steel, the year is 1826 and the sun is setting on the golden age of piracy. Everyone has grown up knowing about the stories of the formidable dragon fleet headed by the ruthless woman, the head of the dragon. 
Canton. Zhang wants nothing more than to move away from her quiet island and move to Canton, where she'll be able to help her mother run her tea house. And this is all to prove to her mother that Zhang is worthy of her attention and praise. Her father, on the other hand, is a story like the Dragon Fleet, and the only memento that she has of him is a golden medallion. However, when it's stolen by a girl named An, An later returns with the medallion in order to get Zhang's help, because there's a map hidden inside this medallion, and they need Zhang's help in order to decode it. The map that's been hidden away in the medallion this entire time, the map that leads towards the last treasure of the head of the dragon, which is hidden on an island shrouded in mist. And so, to prove herself to her mother and to herself, she joins Anne on this dangerous mission in order to try and find the treasure. But soon they'll realize that the seas are far more dangerous than the legends had led them to believe. The first thing that I want to highlight in my review is the head of the dragon named Zheng Yixiao, or otherwise known in the West as Madame Ching. Now, this was weirdly enough one of the titular characters in the recent Doctor Who special, The Legend of the Sea Devils. I was already interested in learning more about Zheng Yixiao, and just seeing her mentioned in this was just superbly amazing to see. And as this book and both under the black flag mention her, it only adds to the fact that she was one of the most formidable and intimidating pirates that the seas had ever witnessed. And this is only exemplified by the punishment set out by Zheng Yixiao, written in the articles of their crews. The punishment for disobeying an order for stealing from the common treasure or public fund was death by beheading. For deserting or going absent without leave, a man would have his ears cut off. For concealing or holding back plundered goods, the offender would be whipped. If the offence was otherwise repeated, he would suffer death. Alongside this, the titular character of Zheng was so interesting to read about. With it being a Treasure Island remix, I definitely found that Zheng shared some characteristics with Jim Hawkins, as both of them share similarities in their journeys. They are both motivated by the same objectives in order to go and pursue the treasure, as Lee notes in their author's note. Treasure Island is, at first, a story about stories. Jim Hawkins and the tale of Flint's treasure, the legacy of the riches, and the possibility are what drive him to pursue it to save his mother's inn. Zhang looks to take control of her fate, her own destiny, and choose a life that's right for herself, instead of always looking to her mother to choose it for her. It is this moment that establishes a Bildung's Roman, establishes that coming of age story, as they are able to become more independent and start making their own conscious independent decisions. I found that both Treasure Island and A Clash of Steel definitely followed the typical Campbell Joseph he Campbell Joseph? Campbell Joseph. Joseph Campbell's hero's journey narrative. In Zhang's case, I found that her character was just so thoroughly developed, and I really loved hearing her perspective throughout the story. It was just a refreshing voice, and I loved it. As well, the themes of safety, risk, found family, and approval were key in this story. And so when she joins the crew of the Hoin Vu, Zhang immediately notes how this feels like a family, with years and years of intimacy and affection and teasing. An awful lot of teasing. And so it's this bonding that she experiences while she's on the Hoin Vu that really calls into question the experiences that she's had so far in her life. She's missed out on so much affection from her mother, and here on the Hoin Vu, she is seen as an equal and is praised for every single effort that she puts in. It's such an interesting juxtaposition, but then also proves why a lot of people might want to turn to piracy. It's this kind of promise of community, and also the opportunities for endless wealth. It's also the themes of found family that really resonated with me without this because of the crew of the Hoin Vu, Master Fang. Master Fang Bang. That man. Also, it reminded me of a lot of the experiences that I had with Our Flag Means Death, as I really considered the crew of the Revenge to be one massive fan family, and we really see this development progress throughout the entire series. So far, I haven't finished it yet. This novel proves that it's through piracy that a lot of people found people they wanted to spend the rest of their lives with, or even just found friends they could really connect with for the very first time. But it also highlights how betrayal can be on the doorstep, depending on how greedy one person can get. It really utilizes the fact that whilst you can make friends you shouldn't trust them. But also, given how serious this novel can be at points, we also do get some comedic moments, such as one of my favourite quotes from this novel, Everyone should be afraid of those who can embroider. We have the patience to keep stabbing the same thing over and over again. Clever. So cool. And so, whilst I did love this novel, and I do definitely prefer it to Treasure Island, this novel could have definitely been a bit shorter, as there were moments I feel like weren't necessarily needed. And so, maybe like a little bit of a tightening of the narrative would have probably made this a five-star read for me. A Clash of Steel proves that Zhen Yixiao was one of the greatest and formidable pirates that had ever lived, and that the real treasure was the family that we made along the way. I saw the opportunity, and I took it. Overall, this was just such a fantastic bug.
So for the penultimate book of this video, I decided to go for a book that was set in the Caribbean because one, I'm half Jamaican and two, somewhere that had so much activity with piracy definitely requires a book set in that region. And so it's because of this, I chose to read Kamosha of the Caribbean by Alex Wheatle. And as you can tell, Kamosha and I are matching outfits today. We've both got white tops on, red, it's a whole moment. And I was not disappointed in this tale of Kamosha. It's a dynamic and compelling story about the power of freedom and life in Jamaica during during the start of the golden age of piracy. This story follows Kamosha, who after growing up in slavery is sold to work in the lawless Port Royal. And after certain circumstances force her to make a daring escape, she encounters a man who offers her a new life by teaching her in the ways of sword fighting. From this, Kamosha becomes empowered to go on an adventure on the high seas with the notorious Captain Morgan in order to earn her brother's freedom, save her soulmate Isabella, and stand up for her people. However, along the way, she'll have to pay a terrible price. I I was completely enamored by this story of Kamosha, who remains strong-willed and positive while she tries to free her brother from the clutches of slavery. In his author's note, Wheatle mentions that he was weary of all the Pirates of the Caribbean films where no black character plays a significant role, and outraged by the depiction of Friday in Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. I set to work creating a black heroine for the modern times, Kamosha of the Caribbean. Throughout the novel, Kamosha trains with a black man called Ravenhide, who unlike Kamosha is actually a free man and owns property in Port Royal. Having some semblance of respect from the white men in Port Royal because he is the only man that can really make good quality barrels. And so it puts into perspective that you're only respective if you have a distinct talent and you're only useful. Later, they're able to earn a place on Captain Henry Morgan's satisfaction, where Kamosha tries to earn money in order to earn her brother's freedom. It is this deviation from the typical slave narrative that sets it apart from other stories. Now, that doesn't say it doesn't shy away from some of the nasty behaviors associated with slavery, but it also provides an optimistic outlook in the sense that slaves were able to find freedom in one way or another. Multiple cases of this are present in pirate history, as like I often mentioned, a lot of pirate ships were made up by former slaves. But also, this book can be used when discussing our flag means death in order to highlight the importance of people of colour on the pirate ship during this point of history. We already know the treatment of people of colour in this period was hell, and that is an understatement, but we also see this in our flag means death with the treatment of people of colour from the navy and the aristocrats. It's these moments of when the Navy and aristocrats make comments about people of colour that really show the stark differences between piracy and the upper aristocracy. Overall though, Commotion of the Caribbean presents a story filled with hope and joy that was ultimately refreshing to read, combined with a wonderful sapphic romance and a distinctive narrative voice that I vastly enjoyed. Commotion is truly a role model for kids who want to experience piracy for the very first time, and thus it is a great story. I wanted to do something that whilst it was connected to pirate history, it definitely took that romanticization and cranked it up to 5,000 or over 9,000. And so I went with Captured by Beverly Jenkins. And this one was primarily recommended to me by Syl from the Book Voyages. Syl on Twitter is basically who I go to for a lot of my romance recommendations because she just has the best, best romance recommendations. And yet again, Syl has given me a really good romance to read. This is the third book in the Levesque family series. However, each book does stand alone in and of itself, and so I was really happy to hear that because I don't want to have to do what I did last time and read two books before I get to this one. I do feel like this review is going to be much shorter than the rest because I've already exhausted all of the pirate context that I've had, and so this is just purely going to be about the book. One of the cool things that I did find through reading this book, though, was that Beverly Jenkins actually cites Under the Black Flag as one of her sources whilst researching for this book, and it's just so cool to see, like, another book come out in another book, and it's just amazing. So, Captured basically follows Dominic Levesque, a notorious privateer who has just captured a coveted prize, a British vessel. Whilst on a dangerous mission against the Crown, Dominic can't help but be attracted to Claire Sullivan, the slave that's aboard the ship. Consumed by desire and a desperation to have her, Dominic offers Claire freedom in exchange for a most pleasurable night in his bed. Claire, on the other hand, believes that Dominic is just a seductive rogue that is used to getting everything that he wants. But as she too begins to feel the passion between them, she realizes that Dominic has not only captured her body, but also has captured her heart as well, and she doesn't want him to let go. However, 
As in typical romance fashion, there are threats that loom on the horizon that seek to tear their romance apart. Captured was overall a very good story, and I definitely found the relationship between Claire and Dominic to be very enticing to read. Their passion and dedication to one another was very tantalizing, you could truly tell they were in love with one another. Whilst I initially thought we were going to get like an enemies to lovers scenario, with Claire being a slave and Dominic being a privateer, it actually turns out to be more of like a friends to lovers scenario. I'm not mad about it, but I think it's worth pointing out because the synopsis does give enemies to lovers vibes. I also love the pace in which they were developing the relationship with one another. And when the wider plot begins to affect their relationship in different ways, it's really exciting to see them go through these trials together. But also, can I just mention that the way that Dominic and Claire are described in this book do not match the cover models that are on this cover. It's it's hilarious, but it's also sad because you would probably never see this happen with a white romance, and that is all I'm probably gonna say on that because, you know, apparently I make everything about race. However, I do wanna give a special shout out to Claire, who is presented in a similar way to Kamosha, filled with courage and also has a lot of wisdom. And outside of the romance, the plot was pretty okay, but it was the characters that really added the flavor to this book. The minor characters specifically just gave more of a love for this novel because the way they interact with Claire and Dominic is just so amazing. I can't really point towards how I would relate this novel to Our Flag Means Death, apart from like saying that pirates should get to fall in love and fuck. Or well, I guess you could say these both also do contain elements of revenge, I mean with like Dominic and then Jim. I did it. I did it. I managed to match every single book to something in Our Flag Means Death, and I am so proud of myself. However, Jenkins does not shy away from showing the atrocities that were caused by colonialism. However, it's also worth pointing out that she, while she does this, she also presents moments of characters going through the healing process and also enacting their own retributions. And I think you all know by now how much I love, I am obsessed with a good revenge. And although I wish there was a little bit more action and the writing wasn't exactly the best and the smart probably wasn't needed. It's definitely one of those books that's just an enjoyable read and one that I probably will reread in the future. And so yeah, that is basically all of the books. And now let us get on to the wrap up. Hello besties, and welcome to the wrap up of today's video. I would have worn a black pirate cap had I had one, however I don't. But in the introduction, I dressed in a kind of steed bonnet style of outfit. For the conclusion, I thought why not go for a bit of black beard. I do not have a black beard, but I do have leather trousers. Yeah, I think if you just look at it like this, I'm gonna take off the hat though, because it is really warm in this room right now. Be sure to get that drink of water. I may not have the beard like Blackbeard, but I certainly do look like him in like episode 10 of Our Flag Means Death, which means yes, yesterday I finished the show. I did a whole live tweet over on Twitter. So I'll have the entire thread linked down below. We really need a season two HBO. Like Heartstopper literally just got renewed for seasons two and three. Please HBO, renew Our Flag Means Death for at least a season two. Follow the trend. We know you like to do that. Episodes six through 10 were just amazing. I really loved the entire season. It's just such a good example of television and a good example of piracy as well and just kind of like how found family can come together and really support one another and also how some people can just be utter shits. So all in all these were all the books that we read today plus one for One Piece Volume 2 which means we have read a grand total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We have read 12 books for this video friends and you know like I did for the last video I'm probably gonna have a break. I'm supposed to be going to Oxford this weekend. It's gonna be very exciting. I'm filming two videos whilst I'm there. They're not like intensive like these 12 book, 14 bookathons, which do take quite a bit of time to make, hence why the videos this month have been very low. I don't know if I'll be doing an April wrap up. I might just do my favorites for April and May. But the next two videos on my channel are gonna be a lot of fun. I have a book shopping vlog in Oxford and then a dedicated reading vlog to just one book, and that is Babel by RF Kuang. But let us go through my top three favorite books for this video. For number one, I would probably say my favorite book from this video would be A Clash of Steel by C.B. Lee, purely because it was a lot better than Treasure Island for me. It really gave me a good look into piracy in China. Also the journey that Zheng goes on through like crafting your own destiny and forging your own fate, it really spoke to me and is definitely a novel that I vastly enjoyed. Alongside like forging your own fate and deciding how you're going to live, I think that Maggie Takuda Hall's The Mermaid, The Witch and the Sea was definitely my next favorite book of this video. It was just so stunning. And Florian and Evelyn's relationship, how it forged together was just so beautiful and I really love a 
language that was used in this as well, and the little stories that we got, it was just amazing. Finally, I do want to give a big shout out to Under the Black Flag by David Cordingly, because without this book, I probably wouldn't have had the wealth of information that I had for this video, and just being able to talk so much about different aspects of piracy, it was really amazing. But yeah, that is basically everything for today's video. At the premiere last time, a lot of people were getting sad that this was like the end of the video, and I know, it's always a sad time when a video ends, because it's kind of like we're closing the book on like another project, another story, and you know, it's always sad. But there is one quote from Under the Black Flag that I would like to leave you with today, and basically it just sums up everything that I feel about piracy, our flag means death, and everything as a whole. The fact is, we want to believe in the world of the pirates as it has been portrayed in the adventure stories, the plays, and the films over the years. We want the myths, the treasure maps, the buried treasure, the walking the plank, the resolute pirate captains with their cutlasses and earrings, and the seamen with their wooden legs and parrots. We prefer to forget the barbaric tortures and the hangings, and the desperate plight of men shipwrecked on hostile coasts. For most of us, the pirates will always be romantic outlaws living far from civilization on some sunny, distant shore. And so yeah, it's just one of those things that like, despite the violent and atrocious history associated with piracy, there are aspects of it that we like to treasure and we like to celebrate. And it granted a lot of freedom to a lot of people, and for that we can appreciate it. And so yeah, if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and if you're new here, be sure to click that subscribe button so you're notified whenever I upload next. If you want to find me on any other social medias, I'll have them linked in the description down below for you so you can follow me on every single other platform. And so yeah, I guess until the next time. Bye besties.